Mr. Casey, ready? And congratulations, sir, uh, to you and Tim Rubix for the raise of $100 million by RDA Capital. Next, um, interestingly, you know, the topic was brought up about fresh funds coming in the market. How do we actually grow the industry in a responsible and sustainable way? Um, next up, we have a dialogue and sharing. Uh, we will be joined by the SEC Commissioner, uh, Ms. Hester Pierce, uh, live stream, on the topic of leadership in responsible innovation, moderated by none other than Professor David Lee from SUSS. Prof, please. Commissioner Pierce, uh, just allow me to introduce you. So do allow me to introduce Commissioner Hester Pierce. She's a lawyer by training and has worked in Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, now known as Wilmer Hill, earlier in her career. She has worked as a director of the Financial Markets Working Group at the MacArthur Center at George Mason University, and she was an adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School. Commissioner Pierce has many publications and her speeches have been used in Singapore University of Social Sciences and National University of Singapore as course materials, widely read by the students of um, cryptocurrency as well as blockchain. Her views have been supported by many who see responsible innovation as the way forward for the healthy growth of the economy. She's also very well respected for her expressed views that market regulatory micromanagement may not necessarily be good for the financial sector and that the more important regulation becomes, the less are banks oriented towards their actual duty. Given her views, they are similar to many central bankers and regulators in this part of Asia, it is not surprising that exactly three years ago today at the Singapore Uni University of Social Sciences that she mooted the idea of a safe harbour for some crypto activities. For those who have not read her speech on the SEC website, it's entitled Renegade Pandas, Opportunities for Cross-Border Cooperation in Regulation of digital assets. And she mentioned digital assets three years ago and regulation. It is far sighted and very inspiring. She has many more speeches that give deep insights into how the regulators work and how we can have responsible innovation. This is indeed a great honor to have her agree to share her views at this conference so early in the morning. So, Commissioner Pierce. It is a great pleasure to have you virtually here so early in the morning with us. We sincerely express our appreciation to you for making the efforts to have a long-distance conversation with us. Perhaps it would be well, good Professor to have Lee, you... Professor Lee, thank Bye. you so much. It's such a delight to be back with you, even if it's, uh, even if it's only virtual. So good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful conference. I hope you had a great day today. And I do have to start with my standard disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Yeah. So maybe we can put our hands together once more to welcome Commissioner Pierce. So Commissioner, um, you, have, you have not been to Singapore for the last three years. Perhaps you'll be good to have you share with us what has happened since you left Singapore and whether we have made much progress in the regulation of cryptocurrency and ETFs. Well, so it has been, it's hard to believe it's been three years to the day. Um, it was such a wonderful experience to be there in Singapore. And in one word, um, in some ways, nothing has changed, right? There's been, there's been very little progress 
on the regulatory front, but I think it's a little more complicated than that. Um, we are not as far along as I thought we would be in the t in those three years. Uh, it, in, and again, I'm I'm giving you the U.S. perspective and and specifically focusing on on the SEC. Um, I did, as you mentioned, moot an idea for a safe harbor there in Singapore, and and then I went on to more fully formulate what a safe harbor would look like for initial coin offerings for for token sales to the broad public, and the idea was to address this concern that the people selling the tokens have information that the people buying the tokens really need to get. And sometimes they get that in a white paper, but having them provide that information in a way that's backed up by the securities laws seemed like a valuable contribution to me. And so that was, the, the idea was to have tailored disclosure that made sense in this space and, and to, to uh, get that out to people. So I put the idea out there in the hopes that my colleagues might be intrigued by it uh, I was not able to convince, and so far have not been able to convince my colleagues to get behind it, but the safe harbor did get, a version of the safe harbor did get included in, in a legislative draft in Congress, um, and Congress more generally has been getting much more interested. So I think one of the big changes over the last three years in Washington has been a much deeper interest both at the regulatory level and at the congressional level in crypto and, and in what a, an appropriate crypto regulatory framework could look like. And I think that that discussion and debate is really important um, to try to get us to the right place. So that at least is some progress. On the regulatory side, we've seen the SEC take a pretty, a, a pretty enforcement centric approach, meaning that we bring enforcement actions, um, sort of one-off enforcement actions, trying to address some of the problems in the space. You know, fraud is, of course, something that we've we've been bringing enforcement actions about for our whole history, and this iteration of it is crypto fraud, and we're still bringing those kinds of cases. We've also brought quite a few registration-only cases, meaning in the United States, if you're if you're making a securities offering you're required either to, to register it or to rely on an exemption from registration. And those exemptions typically do not allow you to sell to the broad public. And so the cases we brought have said the, that, that many of these token offerings didn't comply with those securities laws. My view is we would have been more productive had we instead simply brought uh, worked on, on bringing a regulatory framework into place and then allowing people to come into compliance with that regulatory framework rather than trying to go back several years and, and try to bring enforcement actions. I think we could have prevented some of the bad activity had we done something like that. Not to say that we would have prevented it all, but I think we could have prevented some of it and I think we could have been on a better footing now in terms of having regulation in place. But because this time has passed, now a lot of people are very frustrated at the SEC and they're looking at other regulators. In the United States, we have a lot of federal financial regulators and people are looking around at other financial regulators and saying, well, maybe we should give crypto regulation to them instead of to the SEC. And so now you're seeing a little bit of a jurisdictional uh, tug of war uh, for control over crypto. And, and so I think the next year and a half or so is gonna be very consequential for, for regulation of crypto in the United States. I think that's very interesting uh, perspective from you. Uh, from, and I can, I can see that uh, uh, currently there's still a silo in the regulatory environment. So um, is that something that will, will continue uh, more in a silo, a more holistic approach to crypto token or cryptocurrency or stable coins or ETF regulation? Do you see that uh, there's a change in the environment in regulation in the US or you still think that it's going to be fairly silo? Well, I think by nature, because the United States has 
this dispersed regulatory authority will always have some siloing. Uh, that said, I think you've seen in Congress some holistic attempts to deal with crypto. Recently, Senators Lummis and Gillibrand issued a draft piece of legislation that really was intended to cover crypto, all of crypto, um, put out a broad framework. Their idea is to get conversation flowing around that, but that was a very ambitious attempt to regulate the whole space. Then you also have some more narrow attempts. I think we've all across the world seen a lot of attention on stable coins recently. And so I think stable coins was already a discrete issue that Congress could take and, and deal with and kind of get its head around. And so I think the recent events around stable coins have just propelled those conversations forward. So my guess is that we're likely to see action on something discrete like stable coins before we see a broader, more holistic effort. I and my colleague, Commissioner Pham, who is at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, have requested our two agencies to come together, to break out of that silo, to come together and hold joint conversations with the public around what appropriate regulation would be. I think that would be a, a, a very useful first step, not only for regulators, uh, but also I think for Congress as they're thinking about what kind of legislation to develop. So I'm hopeful that maybe we can do something like that. Yeah, there's this very interesting development that we are seeing in America at this moment. So, in fact, um, this afternoon, you know, I, answer, Lee, yes. I didn't. I didn't answer one of your questions, which was you asked about a Bitcoin exchange traded product, and I think that's also kind of an interesting data point because um, if you had asked me three years ago at, at this conference, will there be a Bitcoin exchange traded product approved in the United States three years hence, I would have certainly thought that there would have been. Uh, but here we are, three years later, and we actually. We do have products approved. They're, they're futures-based products, but we don't have a spot-based product, a cash product uh, approved yet in the United States. And that distinguishes us from many other countries which have approved such products. So I don't understand why we're taking so long on something like that. It's, it's a very standard kind of product in the United States. There's an established futures market, which means that um, a, a spot exchange traded product would not be unusual. I think people are just wondering because um, in futures you have, you, you have leverage, you know, you have margin, but in ETFs it's just um, well, fully in, invested in the coins itself. So I think there's a lot of uh, interest to see the development. And this afternoon I received a lot of WhatsApp questions for you. And if you don't mind, uh, I, have, I have three gentlemen who sent in a few questions. And the first one is from Nizan Ismail. He's the CEO from Eticom Consultancy, Head of Regulatory and Compliance Subcommittee, our own Blockchain Association of Singapore. Now, th this is the, his WhatsApp to me. Um, he wrote that you have said that the US has adopted the ball, uh, has dropped a ball on crypto regulation. You have also been quoted as saying that there's a lot of fraud in the space, but at the same time, we are not allowing innovation to develop and to experiment to happen in a healthy way. From this part of the world, the perception is that the U.S. has been regulating crypto through aggressive enforcement, through its long arms of judicial reach. It also has a very wide view of what constitutes a security. What concrete steps do you think must happen for the U.S. to show its global leadership in the crypto regulation? I think he's asking for your own personal view on this. Would you like to share with us? Well, that's 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 a great question, and I think um, it is true that we've we've been bringing a lot of enforcement actions. And as as your question notes, there's a lot of fraud in the space, so there's no end of enforcement actions we could bring to go after frauds. And sometimes it's a question of which regulator should bring those kinds of actions because there are people who have been defrauded in the United States, but also across the world. Uh, and, and so I think we should, we should work together with our global counterparts to figure out how to allocate our regulatory resources, which, which jurisdiction makes the most sense to bring a particular action. 
um, that's an area we can work together. In terms of, of setting the, the sort of global precedent um, for good regulation, I don't think we've done that so far. I think we've, we've seen a lot of other jurisdictions moving forward with regulation, most notably recently, the European Union has, has put forth a pretty comprehensive regulatory package. Um, it does sometimes take the United States longer to move because we have so many federal regulators and you know, there's been a lot of other stuff going on in the world. So Congress has had a lot of other stuff to take to pay attention to. So it's, it's understandable that sometimes these things can take some time. Um, but I'm still optimistic that if we if we can learn from what others are doing and we can we can try um, here to, to set some some clear regulatory guideposts that it could be useful not only to us but to the rest of um, to the rest of the world but it's it's a lot of work and I think um, I think that's that's the question are we going to sit down and do that work or are we going to just rely on enforcement actions which have their place but again they often come too late um, and so we we really would be better off building the, the regulatory framework. Yeah, um, I can remember those are the points that we have raised three years ago in the same speech in Singapore, talking about cross-border cooperation in regulation. So it has been three years. I think we are still working on it. I'm sure that uh, at some stage uh, that will come across, uh, but it seems that that is still in an early stage. I have, an, I have two questions from Sean I'll Lim. I'll say though, yeah. can I just add one thing, Professor Lee, which is that we do work together quite a bit in terms of, um, we have international organizations that are working together to understand crypto. We share a lot of information. There is a lot of back and forth going on. And, and there's always a lot of cooperation on the enforcement front it's very important that we maintain those cooperative relationships. And so while I'm discouraged um, that we haven't made more progress in the United States, I will say that there has been a, a concerted effort to work together on crypto and a, a whole host of other issues. In some ways, with all of the negative things that COVID brought, it did enable us to work together maybe more seamlessly across borders because we could get on video calls easily. Um, you don't have to step on a plane um, and you couldn't during COVID. And so in some ways that, that made us realize how easy it is to do something like what we're doing today. Would I prefer to be there in person? Of course, but we can still have a conversation even though I'm not. And I think international regulators realize that too. Sure, yeah. I, yeah we can see there are a lot of international regulators, uh, FATF, Financial Stability Board, they're all working on the same issues. But I suppose that uh, I think the community and also for crypto uh, entrepreneurs are looking for more guidance uh, in that direction as well. Um, I was going to say that uh, we also have two questions from Sean Lim of Artichoke Capital. And the first question is that a lot of recent developments in the US around the SEC working to categorize tokens as securities. What is your outlook on how the regulation uh, or the regulatory framework develops in the US, that's part of the question. And he go on to ask who ultimately decides which regulatory agency, whether it's SEC, CFTC, or, any, or perhaps a new agency, should set out clear guidelines for industry to enable compliance, and when? And do you have any thoughts, as you earlier say, that you can share on the Loomis Gilly Brand Bill, as you mentioned earlier, uh, or also known as Responsible Financial Innovation Act to create a regulatory framework for digital assets in the United States. Many questions there. What are your views? Well, I think that this is remains a central question of how do you figure out when someone is, is selling a token as part of a securities offering. I've been quite critical about my agency's own approach toward that. I think we've, we've sort of forgotten the fact that once you label something a security in the United States, there are a whole host of other requirements that flow around that. And so we really have to be much more precise in our thinking about when something is, is a security and when it isn't. Um, so 
right now that question is being determined through enforcement actions primarily and that's just not a that's that's not a particularly useful way to do that so when Lummis and Gillibrand came out with their bill which I mentioned is quite comprehensive I think one of the things they were trying to do was was try to help people think through what that framework should look like, what fits in the securities bucket, what should be in the commodities bucket. Um, and other bills in Congress have tried to do something similar, putting definition around when a digital asset is a security. That's not an easy thing to do, actually. And if you do it wrong, you can either pull in way too many things or you can exclude too many things from, this, from the SEC's jurisdiction. Um, so I think ultimately it's Congress's decision who gets to regulate this space. But in the meantime, you're, you're seeing a lot of regulators trying to assert their authority over different, uh, over different tokens and different token issuers and different platforms that are, issue, that are listing tokens. It remains indeed. to be seen. Yeah, indeed, all the issues are very complicated and a slight move will have uh, severe consequences sometimes. And here's a follow-up question on any thoughts on the outlook and timing of developments around the regulation of private stablecoin issuers in the US? Uh, what, in your view, will be the most impactful outcoming developments in the regulatory framework for digital assets? I think everybody is looking at stablecoins, digital assets, and looking for leadership from the US. What are your views, Commissioner? Well, I do think that that's the area we're going to see, um, and we already have seen some movement with drafts floating around um, in Congress. The question is, who is the right regulator for stablecoins? Are they most appropriately regulated by banking regulators? Could the SEC be the regulator, much as it would regulate a, a money market fund? Some people have compared many stable coins to money market funds. The real question for me is making sure that people understand, how can we best make sure that people understand what is backing a stable coin? Now, some of that is already happening because the market is driving it. People are saying, well, wait, I want to know what you, you know, what, what is backing it? And so some issuers are already putting out more information about what's behind the stable coins and maybe even getting someone to come in and audit that. Um, but you could substitute for those private initiatives a regulatory framework. And I, I suspect that that's something that we'll see in relatively short order, relatively quickly, because again, it is this dis discrete issue. Um, so I, I, I hope that um, we can see something there. Uh, I'm not the one to decide whether it should be banking regulators or someone else. Um, I, I do think that we we need to be careful, and again, this isn't my area, but we need to be careful about not extending deposit insurance too broadly. So I, I, I hope that's something people are thinking about. That's great. I have two more questions from you. Um, this is from Chris Holland, partner at Holland & Marie, a Singapore consulting firm. And his first question questions is, what can good actors in the digital asset space do to engage the regulators and encourage thoughtful regulation? Well, I want to pick up on a theme that Mr. Reddy um, spoke about in, in his remarks, which is, you know, I think recognizing that there's a lot of skepticism of crypto is important. And a lot of that skepticism is frankly well-earned, right? Because there is a lot of fraud and there is a lot of focus on early monetization, as Mr. as Mr. Reddy pointed out, um, there needs to be a realization that when people are looking from the outside, they want to see what is this useful for? And if they don't see what it's useful for, and they see a lot of people getting hurt um, by losing a lot of money, then they're, they're, the regulatory inclination is to shut it down. It's not to allow it to go forward. So understanding that people need to point out bad actors to the regulators so that the regulators can pursue them. People need to focus on building things and not spend all their time um, 
talking about the number going up. Um, and, and then, you know, be candid with regulators. One thing that I've suggested is it's very helpful if people come to me with very specific ideas about where a regulatory framework would be helpful and what that regulatory framework would look like. Of course, I'm going to be using, you know, I'm going to be skeptical of whatever you present me, but it can be helpful to me in my own thinking um, and, and figuring out where I need to advocate for some regulatory clarity. And I think that's... The, it it follows up with uh, disclosure, right? That's, that's one area, and that's his second question. What do you think about the quality of disclosure in the digital assets sector, ranging from disclosure on the legal entity that operates a crypto exchange to, to how concepts like farming or staking adequately explain the transactions happening and how the investor will be treated during insolvency? Well, I think those are great questions. And, and so it, my answer, general answer is it depends, right? There's a lot of variation across platforms and issuers in terms of how much disclosure they're giving. And I think the recent events have focused attention on some issues around such as w what happens in an insolvency. And I think that's, that's very healthy that people are thinking about that and that people are being forced to sit down and spell out this is this is where you would fall in the in the uh, creditor uh, priority line. Uh, so I think I think that's that's very important. Um, one thing I'm concerned about is that I've had people come to me and say we want to make these disclosures, we want to do what's right, but we're concerned that if we do, it will end up drawing regulatory attention in a negative way to us. And so, again, I think that's why we really need to have some kind of a framework that gives people um, the, the nudge to do that, right? And, and then their, their lawyers will, well, it's, it's more than a nudge if it's a regulatory framework, right? But then their lawyers can point to something and say, no, this is what's expected of you. And so that will raise the standard across the board and make it easier for people to distinguish among projects. I think the question is really is really insightful in terms of pointing to those terms um, such as yield farming and staking and other kinds of terms that are, are really quite difficult to get your arms around. I find that many concepts in crypto are very difficult. I'm spending a lot of time trying to learn about them and understand, um, but it's really it's really hard. And so for regulators who spend even less time or for consumers who spend less time on it, um, it's going to be difficult. So I always tell people, if you're trying to sell something, your goal should be to get people to understand what it is you're selling to them. If your goal is to compl complicate and confuse, you have a real problem. You should be wanting to have people 100% on the same page as you before they buy. Yeah. So I, I have to ask you this question, Commissioner. Because I have been um, watching the space of uh, regulators and a lot of people think that regulators shouldn't make any mistakes. Every mistake is very costly and there's a lot of noise in the market, there's a lot of uh, distrust in this uh, nascent technology and uh, innovative space. So I have to ask you this question. To you, what is leadership in r responsible innovation? Well, people talk a lot about responsible innovation, and I think that's that's important, right? Why do you want to be an innovator? You want to be an innovator because you want to solve a problem. You want to give something to people that they don't have now. You want to make their lives easier. Um, that's That's fantastic. But I think we haven't had, as regulators, we haven't had a, a responsible regulatory approach. And that has bred, I think, a lot of irresponsibility across the space. I'm not saying that it's the regulator's fault uh, entirely. It absolutely isn't. There's a there's, we, We've seen a lot of bad activity. We've seen a lot of people putting projects out there that they say are decentralized and they're actually a few guys in a back room who have the ability to take all the money in the treasury of that project 
um, or you know you you see people who are who are really putting a project out there with an idea of raising a lot of money to do nothing with it. So there's a lot of irresponsibility out there. So for innovators, I think focusing on the fact, what is it you're trying to solve? What is it you're trying to bring to people and pouring yourself into that? But on the regulatory side, because we've been so unclear about what the regulation is, innovators are spending a lot less time thinking about that problem solving aspect and thinking more of what can I do to fit within the regulatory framework, which is really unclear to me. And so if we did a better job building a clear framework, I think innovators could spend more time thinking about what it is they're trying to, to, to actually do. And people who are funding those innovators could think about, well, is there anything there to fund or am I just pouring my money into a, a project that's built on air? Right. Yeah, indeed, it's a very complicated situation where it involves in investors, you know, entrepreneurs, as well as regulators. Each have his own set of problems. Each has his some way, some straight jackets being placed in some legacy regulation that we have. So uh, I'm sure all of us has actually benefited from the views of Commissioner. And thank you very much, Commissioner. It has been really informative. Uh, and thanks for sharing your view. Allow me to thank you on behalf of Blockchain Association of Singapore for being with us via Zoom and have a great day ahead. And ladies and gentlemen, we will all put your hands together to thank Commissioner once again. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you have a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the sharing um, and a quick Q&A. I uh, hope you are entertained and um, you know 